2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. So follow along with me as I read that, and then we will pray, and we will get into it together. Paul writing, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which He called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught, whether by word or epistle. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And Father, we pray that as we look at this very meaty, very small bit of Scripture, that You would help us. You would help us, Lord, to develop the same kind of endurance that we saw exemplified in the believers in Thessalonica. Lord, we, we aren't going through probably as difficult things as they were, but Lord, we still need endurance. And, and we're not going to be motivated unless we understand your gospel. So Lord, I pray as we look at what your word says, that your Holy Spirit would minister to us. And Lord, you would use your word and by your spirit, you would prepare us to come before your table. That Lord, as we take communion together at the end, Lord, it would be celebratory and worshipful and reverent. <clears throat> God, that we would not fall into this trap of just going through the motion, but where we would be those that want to draw near to you to feed on your faithfulness. Please, Lord, do what only you can do today by your Holy Spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everyone who agrees says, Amen. Amen. The gospel simply means good news. That's what it means. It means good news, and the gospel simply is the good news about who God is and what God is doing in this world. That's the good news. And sometimes we think of the good news only in the, the, the sort of core facts, as in Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. Those are core facts, those are non-negotiable facts. And so we look at those core facts and we think, okay, that's good. That's the beginning stuff I need to know. But actually, the gospel is not the ABCs of our salvation. It's the A to Z of our salvation. The gospel, this truth about, this good news about who God is and what He's done, is what motivates us to obey, to endure, to worship. And, and a lot of things that Paul's going to talk about here in this last part of chapter 2 are things that we've covered in 1 uh, Thessalonians and in the first part of 2 Thessalonians. But it's interesting that Paul goes back to these things. That he, he wants to bring it all the way back to these things. And it's also interesting to me that he does so in this context. Because the context starts off, verse 13 starts off with him, with him saying, but we are bound to give thanks. But... He's, he's kind of, now kind of turning, he's responding to what he's just talked about. And if you remember last week, he talked about the reality of this counterfeit Christ that is one day going to come on the scene. This counterfeit Christ that wants to wreak havoc, this counterfeit Christ that wants to bring deception, this counterfeit Christ um, who the spirit behind him is already at work in the world. Trying to bring deception to people. Trying to keep people from believing the true gospel. And you would, you would kind of think after this, he might say, So be careful, guys. Watch out. You're one hair away from slipping up. But he doesn't do that. Instead, he says, But guys, we are excited about you. We can't help but give thanks to God about you. And I love this because it makes me remember, it causes me to remember that, that even when things seem really dark, even when it seems like, gosh, are we going to be able to handle this intensity? That God is doing the work. And we need to encourage each other in that work that God is doing. In the grace that we see in each other's lives. 
So that's what Paul's doing. Paul's encouraging them to continue on in this gospel-motivated endurance, going through difficult times, enduring through difficult times, because they're sure of who God is and what God's doing. So I want, I want to talk about what that looks like today. Three things that that looks like, gospel-motivated endurance looks like. First thing we see in how Paul gives thanks, that a big part of this endurance comes from us being thankful for what God does. Look at verse 13 again. He says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, notice, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you. So the first thing Paul reminds them then, and we've talked about this whole issue of election before, we've brought it up a couple times in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. But the first thing Paul wants to say in this is say, man, I am so thankful because it's obvious that God's chosen you and He's chosen you in love. Now this could be just an indication that He's chosen them to suffer, to, to, to suffer, to give credibility to the gospel as, in a sense, first fruits of the area there in Macedonia. It could be that. Or it could also just be the fact that they have been chosen by God for salvation, as he says in the context. But either way, what Paul's wanting to say here is, man, I, I see in your life evidence that God has chosen you, that God's love for you is real, eternal, something that he initiated before you were even made. And he's thankful for that. Now this issue of election sometimes freaks us out, but actually, we can see here, we can see this here in what Paul's saying, it's meant to encourage us, especially when we're going through difficult times. Because sometimes we, we can forget that we're not, this wasn't our idea to follow Jesus. It was God's idea for us to follow Jesus. It was God that pursued us and got our attention and showed us what we needed to know. Oh, we had a response. Yes, we needed to respond to that. We, we had a choice to make, and yes, we, we chose to believe. But still, the point is, he initiated it. It was because he wanted it to happen that it happened. And that's encouraging to us, because if God chose us before we had anything to do with it, we can be assured he's going to finish what he started. Even if it means us going through some pretty heavy, difficult things. This is why Paul's given thanks. In fact, this is why he says he's bound to God. He says, man, I have to say, God, God, you're amazing that you have saved these people and you're keeping these people through some serious difficulty. But notice what he says, that God has saved them for what? He's chose them for what? Verse 13, for salvation through the sanctification by the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, and belief in the truth. And we'll talk about belief in the, in the truth in a second. But this, this idea of that God saved us through sanctification, or chose us for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit. Remember, sanctification is like purification or holiness. It's God set us apart for His purposes. And, and so when, when Paul uses it here, he's talking about God's doing something to make you ready for heaven. He's setting you apart for eternity. He's purifying you. And He's doing this by His Spirit. In other words, Paul's giving thanks to God because God's the one who changes us by His Spirit. Again, this is great news for us because I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at my life and I think, gosh, Lord, the harder I try, the worse I get. I, I want to do better, but I just don't seem to have what I need to do better. And when I get to that place, God's always reminding me, yeah, it's a work of my Spirit. Submit to what I'm doing in you. Let me do that work in you. Cooperate with me to have that work be done in me. He's sanctifying us by His Spirit. Paul's giving thanks to God for this. But he also, he's, he's the one who's called them by His truth. It says, and belief in the truth, they've been sanctified or set apart uh, by the Spirit and by belief in the truth. They believed the truth. What truth is it? Verse 14, to which He called you by our gospel. So in other words, what Paul says is, he's given thanks to God because when they preached the gospel to him, the Thessalonians believed it. They believed the gospel, and that was an indication that God, they belonged to the Lord. Because they believed this gospel. 
In other words, Paul says, man, I look at your life and I think, I never would have expected you guys to respond so well and so quickly to the good news about who God is and what He's doing. To the good news about Jesus' death and resurrection. I'm so surprised you responded so well and I'm so blown away that God's continuing to change you through difficult circumstances and i got to give God thanks for this because He's obviously doing a good work in you. Man, we need to, listen, we need to encourage each other in this. When we see God working in each other's life, we need to say, I see God working in you. I see God working in you. Man, let's just give God thanks. It's funny, we're, we're pretty good about, about praying for each other when we have needs, aren't we? We're pretty good if we say, man, I have a need, that we'll say, well, let's pray for that now. And that's a really good thing. We should keep doing that. We should do more of that. But you know, how, you ever notice how rare it is for us when someone says, I had a really good thing happen. God did this or that. That we say, oh, thank God. And it's as far as we go. We rarely stop and say, you know, let's just take some time to praise God together. And say, God, thank you so much for helping my brother and my sister do this this week. You've been so faithful. You're so good. Lord, help us to remember how faithful you are to do this work in our lives by your spirit. There's something uh, amazingly purifying about us taking the time to give thanks for what he does. It really refocuses our, 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 our mind on where it should be on the Lord. Our hearts to him. Paul says, here's what he's doing. He's giving thanks for this. Now, this is important because I think it's something that we, we, well, we're just not always that good to do. And I think this is really one of the ways that, that Jesus would have us fulfill the, the command he gave us in John 15. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And he says, same context, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it. Do you see what Jesus is saying there? He's saying, listen, here's my command for you. I want you to remain in me, abide in me, continue with me. And I want, I want my words to continue to be a part of, of who you are and what you do. I want you to think about what I've said. I want you to do what I've said. I want you to follow what I've said. And as you do that, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is you're going to recognize, man, God's the one who chose me. God's the one who's done this work. And you're going to bear fruits and you're going to have confidence, more confidence in your prayer life. To be able to say, God, would you do this for me? Would you do this for this person? And... This is what He wants for us. No, God wants to do this work. God's chosen us for this work. This is what Paul's saying. Now, so Paul's thankful for what God does. This is what it looks like to have gospel-motivated endurance. We, we start with thankfulness. God, thank you. You're doing a good work in us. But also it's being committed to what God says. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, what does Paul say? He says, therefore, because this is true, because God's doing this work, therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which, which you were taught. Now, we'll talk about those traditions in a second. But first, I want you to, to get what he's saying here. When he says, stand fast, the, the, the phrase there simply means to stay put. Don't move. Stay in the place where you're meant to be. Stay right there. So many of the problems we find ourselves getting into is because we wander away from where we're supposed to stay. We, do, we wander away from the path that God wants us to be in. Paul says, stand fast. But also he says, and hold. You could even translate this, hold fast. The idea, the idea there is, is holding on to all, with, with all your might, squeezing onto something. It's like you're hanging from a cliff and you're holding it on. I mean, it's just something that you're not going to let go of. Now, now, with this, we might be tempted to think, okay, Paul's saying, okay, it's all up to you. It's all about how, how you stand fast and how you hold tight. And I think it's important that we recognize that, that one of the main points Paul's making here is the idea that we be established. That's the word, in fact, he uses in verse 17, that, that we would be established in every good word and work. And the idea of, of, of establishment or, or stability, we might say, it's important for us that we recognize that this stability, that we're only going to be stabilized as we recognize God's eternal stability. That God doesn't change. That God always keeps His promise. Think about this way. If, if, um, if you are... Uh, if you're in a place, like if you're in a house, an old rickety house, and you're thinking these floorboards are not going to hold me up, okay? 
You don't just think, well, you know, I think what I'll do is I'll jump up and down here because I'm confident that I'm stable enough to handle this. Because you recognize where you're standing is bad. So what do you do? You move away from those unstable floorboards and you stand somewhere where there's stability. Because your stability is dependent upon where you stand, on the stability of the floor that you stand on, or the foundation that you stand on. And so what Paul's saying is saying, listen, because God's always going to be faithful to do what he does, because we can be thankful that God's doing what he does, then stand there. Say, God, God I'm not moving. I'm not going to try to take things over. I'm not going to try to make things happen. I'm going to just stand right here. It's because you're stable that I have stability. It's because you're consistent, because you keep your promises, because you don't change, that I have stability. I'm going to stand right there, and I'm going to hold on to what you say. In fact, this is what he means by traditions. But actually, before I say this, before I go on to that, that bit, I should say this. Uh, notice what he says in verse 15. He says, therefore, brethren, plural. And that means a couple of things. One, it means that, okay, this is for everyone, not just one of the brothers there. But also, when he uses the, the verbs he uses here, he uses them in the plural. So the idea there is it's not just you reacting or you standing as an individual. It's not just you saying, okay, it's all up to me. I've got to stand still. Because sometimes we feel like, okay, I think I'm standing, but I'm feeling a bit wobbly. And that's when we really need somebody else to help us get established again, to bring us back to stability. In fact, this is exactly what Paul did uh, by sending Timothy the first time. Remember when we were in 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 3, Paul said this. He said, We sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and encourage you concerning the faith. In other words, it's important that we recognize that this is not just about us individually saying, okay, don't move. It's about us helping each other stand on who God is and what He's done. But also, it's interesting because the, the verbs there, stand, hold fast, they're both in a tense that means they continue to happen. So he's saying, continue to stand, continue to, to stand fast, to hold on. In other words, it's not a one-time thing. It's, it's, it's something that we continue to do. In other words, it's a commitment. You see, we're going to be motivated to endure only if we are committed to what God has said. Again, this is what happens when we wander away from what God says, that's when instability comes. And so God's saying, look, don't do that. Paul's saying, don't do that. In fact, when he says, look, hold on to the tradition, here's what he means. He doesn't mean just some sort of religious establishment. And we know that because God dealt with that, didn't he? Paul, in fact, Paul wrote about uh, the fact that we shouldn't be just kind of going by whatever tradition people say we should have because we can be deceived by this. Listen to this. In Colossians chapter 2, Paul writes, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to notice the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. In fact, the thing that Jesus uh, railed on the religious leaders of his day about was the fact that they were doing this, what he says right here. He says, For you ignore God's law and you substitute your own tradition. So when Paul talks about tradition here, he's not just talking about, okay, stick to whatever tradition you came from, and as long as that is, you know, just, just whatever it was, that tradition is, is the most important thing. Just kind of do what your parents did. That's all that matters. That's not what he's saying. The word for tradition here it literally means something that was passed down to you. It emphasizes that the person who is saying, here's the tradition, didn't make it up himself. That it was given to him. This is exactly how Paul talks about so many things that he writes. Specifically in 1 uh, Corinthians. When Paul talks about communion, which we'll participate in together, here's what he, he says. He says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord Himself. Talking about communion. He says, I didn't make up this sacrament. I didn't make up this practice. I'm just giving to you what the Lord gave to, to me. He says the same thing about the gospel itself. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, he says, I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. So tradition here doesn't just mean uh, just things that we've kind of made up or men have decided are true. It's things that God has said and given us to give to other people. And so Paul's saying to the Thessalonians, listen, you need to stick to this. And this is what they were good at. I mean, this is one of the reasons they're enduring so well. Because these people saw that when the apostles spoke God's word, it was indeed God's word. We saw this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, right? 
Paul says, For this reason we also thank you without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. A huge necessity, a really important necessity for us to endure difficulties is to remember that God has revealed His truth. He has spoken the good news. We don't have to guess about it. We don't have to guess what God means by good. We don't have to guess what news He says is good. We can go to His Word and say, this is what God says is good news for us. This is what God is really like. Now this brings us to the last point. Not only does God, does gospel motivated endurance look like a thankfulness for what God is and a commitment to what God says, but it's a comfort because of who God is. This is a really important thing, and this especially is important as we look at the first part of verse 16. Paul writes something that may not seem that intriguing to you, but it would, it would have probably been really intriguing to uh, any, any of the Thessalonians that had a Jewish background. Because Paul says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and our God and Father who's loved us, may He give you this thing. Now it's interesting because we've seen where, where Paul starts his letters most of the time with, you know, welcoming them or, or greeting them in the name of the Father and, uh, and, and uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's coupled uh, the person of Jesus to the Father and shown that they are uh, to be spoken of in the same sentence, that there's an equal, uh, an equalness to them in some sense. But this is the, one of the only times where he starts with the Lord and then kind of couples that with God. That might not mean much to you, but it was incredibly significant, uh, to, especially to Jewish hearers of that day. Because what he's doing here is he's echoing what the Scripture says throughout the New Testament about the fact of who Jesus is. Because when we're talking about finding comfort... We're talking about being comforted by who God is. We're talking about the God that we see in Jesus. John starts his gospel off like this, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's talking about Jesus. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So John starts off his gospel by saying, here's the beginning of all things. Here's the foundation for everything we believe. And he uses that phrase in the beginning the same way Moses would have used in Genesis to say, here's the foundation for all creation. He's saying, here's Jesus, the foundation for the whole new creation. And he's saying that this, the Word, the Logos, He was with God, and He was God, and He became flesh and dwelt among us. This is important. This is, this, is where, this is where we know that we've gone from believing ideas to trusting a person. Because anybody can believe religious ideas. People do it all the time. I don't know if you realize this or not, but of the whole population of the earth, what is it, 8 billion people now, of the 8 billion people that are, uh, that are on the, alive on this earth now, only a very small fraction are atheists. Which, by the way, is a faith. But a very small fraction are atheists. Most people have some sort of belief system. They're believing in some sort of religious truth. Now, a lot of that religious truth is wrong, but still they're believing in something. But the thing about Christianity is, is that we are called to move beyond just a religious idea to follow a person. Why? Because what, the, what Christianity says about God is not just that God sent someone to speak to His people, that God Himself took on human flesh, the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. So that we find a great comfort in a God who knows exactly what we've gone through. He knows exactly the pain that we've suffered. He knows what it's like to suffer every kind of pain that we suffer. He's a God that knows exactly how hard it is to believe in this world. He's a God that has compassion. And, and there's no other God like this. 
There's no other God like this who, who says, okay, I'm going to enter into the pain of my creation. That doesn't exist anywhere outside of Christianity. Only in Christ do we have this. And so when we're talking about a God that we're comforted by, or taking comfort in who God is, it's important that we recognize it's not just this idea of, oh, that's nice to think there's a God who cares. No. We know that God is real. And we know that God is compassionate. And we know that God is powerful. And we know that God is merciful because He came in the person of Jesus. And so when Paul says this, he say, May this God who loved us and has given us everlasting and good hope by grace, may He comfort your hearts. Interesting. Paul's in other places, all throughout his epistles, talked about uh, comfort, talked about hope. Consolation there is another word for comfort. But we need to really pay attention here uh, to, to uh, some of the words. Specifically, we need to understand that Paul says here, he's done these things for us. God became man and made himself known so that we could know his grace. This is the way he's done it. He, he's... He gives us this everlasting consolation and good hope by grace. Grace is God's favor. And when God gives His favor to us, it's always undeserved. And so this is what we see, that this word grace, it holds with it this, all these important truths about the fact that God gives us what we don't deserve. And that's good news again, because listen... When, when you are struggling, when you are being persecuted or going through trials, oftentimes what happens is your faith gets shaky. And because your faith gets shaky, you start thinking, maybe I'm not really a Christian, and maybe all this is, the, is just proof that God doesn't love me. Maybe if I try a bit harder, things will get better. And in doing so, here's what we're trying to do. We are trying, listen, to endure by works, and it never works. We only can endure when we recognize grace, when we recognize that God's going to give us what we need, not because we deserve it, not because we've earned it, not because we are so faithful. He's going to do it because He's just good. He's just promised us in Jesus this grace, this undeserved favor. Grace. And there's no, because, of the, because it's all about what Jesus has done, there's no reluctance in God to give it to us. It's grace. God isn't going, oh, stupid people, all right, here's some more grace. No, it's not, it doesn't work that way. God says, listen, I am choosing to relate to you with a smile on my face because of what Jesus has done. Because Jesus has done enough to make you right with me. Grace. Now think about these other words here too, these adjectives here. He says, an everlasting con uh, consolation or comfort. Do you know what that means? Listen, it means there will never be a time when God says, no more am I going to comfort you. If you believe in Jesus, if you're in Christ, He has given you by His grace an everlasting consolation. In other words, His comfort is available to you 24 hours a day for eternity. That's an amazing thing to think about. That the God of all comfort says, look, I'm, I'm here for you. I want to comfort you. I want to meet you where you are. Uh, this is what I want to do. And you can know this because of my grace. It's an everlasting consolation. Oh, yeah, but I, I don't really believe like I should. And, no, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's not for me. Well, it's by grace. It's by grace. He says, listen, he's given you not just a hope, but a good hope. This is interesting. Because the word hope itself, that word literally means an expectation of good. And so it's like, this is almost like a, a redundant word. Hey, you get not just an expectation of good, but a good expectation of good. <laughs> it's like it's so good, the word hope isn't enough. It's a good hope. In other words, listen. Good hope means there's nothing in God that is going to disappoint us. Our expectation for the future, because we're going to see Him face to face, because His resurrection guarantees our resurrection, so even death can't keep us from God, our expectation is good, and there's not going to be anything when we see Him that's going to at all lead to disappointment. That's the idea. It's a good hope. There's no way you can be disappointed. 
So no matter how hard your trial is right now, no matter how difficult uh, the things are that you're going through, the, the promise here that Paul's saying, he's saying, listen, I, I'm just promising you there's a good hope. That when you see God, no matter how bad things are, and trust me, things there in Thessalonica were really, really bad. No matter how bad things are, when you see God face to face, you're going to say, it was so worth it. That's the promise. This is an amazing thing. Because I have to say, I, I rarely find a comfort in my circumstances. I find a rest sometime in my circumstances, taking a nap, you know, having a nice meal, whatever. But I rarely find a comfort in my circumstances because my mind's always going about all that I have to do, about all the things that I'm, I'm afraid of. All these things plague my mind. Where I find comfort is going, wait, I have to go back to God. Because I don't know what the future holds. I honestly don't know. Can, can I be honest with you guys? We have this building project and it scares me. Or did I commit us to something that that may not come to pass, that scares me. I don't look like an idiot. I, I, don't, I don't want the stress of trying to make something happen. And I, and I think about these kinds of things, and I think, wait a second, wait a second. I don't know what the future holds, but I do know who holds the future. I know God's still in control. And He says He has a good hope for me. I don't know how that's going to apply to the building, but I know that's still good. I know I can still trust Him. Do you see what I'm saying? And Paul's saying, listen, here's how you endure difficulties. You receive comfort by who God is. That This is the God who gives us what we don't deserve. Guys, listen, this is how liberating the gospel is. Paul writes this, he says in Romans 5.2, Through Christ we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. How do we approach God? Grace. How do we stay walking with God? Grace. How do we know that our future is good? Grace. He gives us what we don't deserve. This is what He's promising. This is what separates Christianity from every other religion in the world. Grace. An unmerited favor. And then He says in verse 17, He says, May this, the Lord do this for you. Listen, He says, To comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. This is important because I love the fact that, that Paul is saying, listen, be comforted by the fact that God's the one who's going to empower you to do this good. I'm praying that God gives you what He needs. Paul's expecting that prayer to be answered, full stop. That God's going to give us what we need to do what we need to do. I love this because... There's something here that's really important for us to get, and that is that God still, in the midst of difficulty, because don't forget, the, the believers in Thessalonica were going through some really serious difficulties. As we said, it was pretty bad when he wrote the first letter. It's gotten worse since he's written the second letter, or that motivated the second letter, really. And then he's saying, look, I want you to be established in every good word and work. In other words, there are things that you need to communicate as believers in Jesus. That God calls you to speak truth to people. To speak the truth in love. God gives us this good news so that we can share the good news. We share the news of it, the information, by speaking. This is who Jesus is. This is what Jesus has done. This is why we need Jesus. That's what the Holy Spirit uses to call people to believe. Good news is in, it's good that we need to demonstrate that it's good. There's good works that we do that, that show that, you know, that, that this God is a good God and the things He calls us to do are good things. We can trust Him. Now this is really important too because a lot of the good word and the good works that the Thessalonians would have had to do would have been to people who opposed them. You know, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard for us to love each other, isn't it? I mean, seriously, it's hard for us to love each other, and we, you know, unless you're, if you're visiting here, we're so glad you're here, but for a second, I want to speak to those who come here regularly. We all come to the same church regularly. We, we kind of, we hear the same sermons, we, we drink the same coffee or tea, 
And it's still hard for us to love each other. We mainly believe the same things. And it's still hard for us to love each other. Ever try to love somebody who thinks you're a crazy person? Who thinks what you believe is nuts? Who gets angry because of what you believe? Thinks you're narrow or bigoted? That's tough. That's supernatural. And so this is what Paul's praying. Paul's saying, listen, I want you to have comfort because God is able and willing and will give you what you don't have. He will empower you, listen, to do good. You'll be able to speak what is good even when others oppose you by the power of God's Spirit. He says, you'll be able to do uh, what is good even to, toward those who oppose you. That's what you'll do by the power of His Spirit. This is what He's praying for the Thessalonians. This is what He's wanting them to have comfort in. Take comfort. God's going to give you what you don't have. Because most of the time, most of the time, in my life, God's called me to, to minister to people and in circumstances that are beyond me. When the windows were put in the, in the building on Monday, I, wor I worked Monday, Tuesday, my day off, and I was feeling a little bit stressy about that, and I was busy doing things. And then the guy who, who, uh, who was doing the windows, uh, we struck up a conversation. And I'll be honest, I really didn't want to talk to him because I was, so my ride was waiting for me, and I thought, oh man, I, I gotta get out of here, you know? And he starts bringing up these questions. But I, as he's talking, I knew the, the Holy Spirit saying to me, you know, you need to talk to this guy about Jesus. He's asking questions. So I did. I got to share with this guy, pray for him, his name's Howard, nice guy. Pray for Howard. Got to share with Howard about who Jesus is, about what he's done, and why he, what he says is more trustworthy than any conspiracy theory that we can find on the internet, because that's something that interested Howard. Pray for Howard. But I'll say, I didn't want to do it. I was seriously getting annoyed with this guy, if I'm being honest. But God called me to do something, and then God gave me the power to do it at that moment. This is what He wants to do. He wants to put us in a place where we say, okay, Lord, you have to do this. And He wants us to be comforted by the fact that He will do it. This is how we endure. Now, this is what we need to stir each other up towards. The Scripture says clearly in Hebrews chapter 10, listen, it says, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works, and let us not neglect our meeting, uh, meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of His return is drawing near. Isn't Paul in 1 and 2 Thessalonians talking about the fact that that day is drawing near? And as we see that day drawing near, he's saying, okay, let our purpose be, how can we motivate each other to keep going, to endure? This is why we eat together. This is why we, we spend another 45 minutes or to an hour and a half, however long it takes for us, to be together, to have a meal and say, let's just encourage each other. Let's motivate each other to keep on keeping on with Jesus. That's why we're together.